we'll start um, on session three. What can we learn from TB, HIV from other co-infections of the South? Clinical and research updates, bedside to bench. I'm David Knight, and my co-moderator is Henry Kozel here. And Wanda is going to be keeping everybody to time, so to watch her for signs as to how you're doing. So um, we heard this morning about uh, Graham Menchie's um, clinical infectious disease expertise and from his studies on TB iris. And this afternoon, he's going to talk about cryptococcal disease. Um, and he's going to in a talk entitled Update on Cryptococcal Disease in Patients with HIV Infection. Thanks. Thanks very much. And um, I'm very glad the organizers asked me to give a second talk because it's a long way to travel from Cape Town just for a single talk. <laughs> Um, so th this talk is, is not intended to be a, a, a thorough overview of cryptococcal meningitis. I just really wanted to provide an update on four aspects. Firstly, the epidemiology. Secondly, this notion of screening for antigenemia prior to the development of meningitis and providing preemptive treatment. Um, and then uh, the recent study on the... Uh, uh, opti on initial antifungal treatment of meningitis that was conducted in Vietnam. And then finally looking at uh, studies that have looked at the optimal timing of ART patients with cryptococcal meningitis and contrast that with, with uh, the TB studies. So in terms of epidemiology, across the literature, uh, looking at uh, adult meningitis in Africa, you'll see that uh, between a third to two thirds of cases of adult meningitis uh, diagnosed in the clinical services in Africa are related to cryptococcal meningitis. Um, data on the uh, incidence of cryptococcal meningitis is obviously sparse across Africa. And the best data is from South Africa, the National Institute of Communicable Diseases, where they collect all laboratory uh, confirmed diagnoses of, of cryptococcal disease on a, on a national level in both the government as well as the private sector and the military laboratories. And are able to pull that and look at incident cryptococcal disease across the country. And this is uh, showing from uh, nationwide from 2005 to 2010 in South Africa. What you can see is despite the rollout of antiretroviral therapy in South Africa during that time, reaching almost a million of people by 2010. Uh, so despite increased uptake of ART, there was an increase in cryptococcal disease in terms of incident cases and then a plateauing. So the important message here is that cryptococcal disease remains a problem in, in Africa despite antiretroviral rollout, which is in contrast to what the experience was in the United States when ART became accessible, uh, AIDS, AIDS defining illnesses in, in a large part dramatically reduced. Um, so, that, so that's the important, one important message. And then just to look at the numbers, that the peak in terms of numbers of cases of cryptococcal disease in South Africa was in 2008, where there were 8,000 cases across the country. So compared to uh, TB, a far less of, a, of, a, of an, a, a, an issue in terms of case numbers. We know in South Africa, there are 350,000 cases of TB a year, 8,000 cases of cryptococcal disease. Um, but I will come back to the issue of mortality, which is far more stu substantial with cryptococcal disease. This is more uh, recent update data from the National Int Institute of Communicable Disease in South Africa, looking at a longer time period from 2002 till 2013, but here yeah, not looking across South Africa as a whole, just looking at the Gauteng province, which is the province around Johannesburg, um, and looking at case numbers mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of cryptococcal disease in the context of the ART rollout. And you can see that ART in 2002, nobody in the public sector was receiving it. By uh, 2013, last year, 400,000 people in that province receiving ART. And what, what's, what's shown is that in the, even in the context of the ART rollout, the number of cases of cryptococcal disease goes, goes up as more people are advancing to, to late stage HIV. But there is a, a, a suggestion that we're starting to see a decrease in case numbers. So going from just over uh, 2,000, 2, 2,200 to 2,000 by 2013, uh, there's a suggestion of a decrease, but again, not the dramatic decrease that we've seen in the industrialized world. Essentially, the message is that although ART is being scaled up rapidly, it's not yet reaching patients with advanced disease at the, at the pace 
to prevent patients progressing to AIDS. And then a very important aspect of the epidemiology of cryptococcal meningitis is, although this is not as common as TB, it's an extremely fatal condition. So that the case fatality rates associated with cryptococcal meningitis, this is uh, three uh, uh, pieces of data from South Africa, uh, is substantial. So in, in our hospital in, in Cape Town, mortality was between 25% uh, and 40%. That's in a research setting where patients are looked after by a dedicated doctor, dedicated nurse, and actually get a, a, a quality of care that is superior to what, what they get in the clinical service. More reflective of the clinical service is data from Johannesburg, large academic hospital, where at three months, two thirds of patients had either died or were lost to follow, presumed to have died. And that's probably most reflective of, of what happens in the clinical service in South Africa. And then a study from rural KwaZulu-Natal, where only 11% uh, of patients were known to be alive at two years after a diagnosis of cryptococcal disease. So even though it's not as common an opportunistic infection as TB, because of this very substantial case fatality rate, it's an important contributor to, to HIV-related mortality across Africa. So the next issue I wanted to discuss was the issue of screening and in introducing preventative interventions prior to the development of meningitis. And obviously, with a condition with such a high case fatality rate, uh, despite treatment, one is thinking upstream and looking for preventative interventions to try and uh, address the mortality associated with cryptococcal disease. So the reason why this is possible is that uh, cryptococcal disease, essentially uh, people uh, get infected by inhaling either the desiccated fungal cells or the spores from the environment. Uh, it then establishes an infection in the lung. Somebody who's immune competent can contain that. If they're immunosuppressed, it, spread, it disseminates. There's a particular predilection for going to the central nervous system and establishing meningoencephalitis. Now, this uh, step between the lung infection, somebody who's immune and compromised, and establishing CNS infection uh, provides is there is a period of time when patients are antigenemic prior to the development of CNS manifestation, and that potentially allows for detection and intervention at that stage to prevent progression to meningitis. And in a retrospective study from, from uh, Uganda, looking at stored uh, blood samples, they were able to show that patients were antigenemic for a median of, of three weeks prior to developing meningitis, and in about 10% of patients, that was three months that they were antigenemic. So if one could detect the antigenemia and intervene, you could potentially prevent the meningitis. And the other important thing is that antigen, uh, antigen, antigenemia is common in ART programs in Africa and Asia among patients entering AR HIV care with advanced HIV. So across a number of studies looking predominantly at patients with CD4 counts of less than 100 or less than 200, the prevalence of antigenemia on patients presenting for HIV care is anything between 2% up to just over 20%. So many patients presenting with advanced HIV have antigenemia, and potentially detecting that intervening could prevent progression to, to, to disease. Um, this is just some data that shows the consequence of antigenemia. This was a study done with uh, retrospectively with stored plasma samples in South Africa they looked at patients entering ART care. Among those with a CD4 count of less than 100, 13% of them were antigen positive. Half of those patients had, had no history of cryptococcal meningitis. And th uh, this was all done retrospectively, so they were able to look what happened on ART, is that a third of those patients developed cryptococcal meningitis despite being started on ART, and another 20% of them died, and presumably some of that was related to cryptococcal disease. So 50% of patients either died or had developed meningitis if they were antigenemic at baseline. The other 50% were ac actually able to clear their antigenemia, presumably with ART alone. And that's just showing you that this is the antigenemia in this study was strongly uh, CD4 dependent, so that it was really clustered in patients who had a CD4 count of less than 100. What about treating uh, the antigenemia? There's no randomized controlled trials. Uh, the, this is observational data from Uganda, where they looked at patients. In this study, there was 9% of patients were antigen positive. They were within the clinical service. 
uh, of the 26, 21 were treated with fluconazole, five were treated with ART alone. All of those treated with ART alone in this study died, and there was better survival in those patients who were treated with fluconazole plus ART. And that's just showing the survival curves, much better survival. Admittedly, a very small study prone to, to, to a, a number of biases given that it's an observational study, but does suggest that, that there is benefit from fluconazole in terms of preventing cryptococcal disease. So in South Africa, we've developed a, an algorithm uh, uh, for screening for cryptococcal antigenemia in patients entering ART care with a CD4 count of less than 100. Uh, if they're antigen positive, they're screened for symptoms. If they've got symptoms of meningitis, they're obviously referred for lumbar puncture. If they're asymptomatic, if lumbar puncture is easily ac accessible, then that's the route to go. But in most clinical settings, it's not easily accessible. If they're asymptomatic, they get put onto high-dose fluconazole and then maintenance uh, and, and uh, secondary prophylaxis with fluconazole. Um, so that's, that's essentially what's being proposed not based on randomized cl controlled trials, but based on observational data and a lot of d indirect data that we know uh, that, that antigenemia has, is associated with substantial morbidity and mortality. This is facilitated by the development of a, a lateral flow dipsticks assay for detecting antigenemia that can be done, it, it uh, takes 10 minutes, uh, can be done on plasma, serum, there's also data for whole blood now, um, and can facilitate screening uh, at the point of care. So antigen, uh, antigen screening and preemptive treatment seems like a good idea, uh, but there are some caveats uh, and issues related to it. Essentially, we need to be able to ensure that the HIV programs can reach these patients that are antigenemic and identify them timelessly. Uh, there is evidence that the patients who are presenting to hospitals in Africa uh, uh, who present with meningitis have access to HIV care. So 30% of them are on ART nowadays, 70% of them knew their HIV status uh, prior to the, the, the index hospital admission, suggesting that there were opportunities within the HIV care pathway to screen them prior to them presenting with meningitis. But there is a narrow time window. As I said to you, on average it's three weeks, and it means screening the patients for antigen, uh, getting the result back, linking it to the patient and getting them onto fluconazole, and that can be a challenge. There's the program implementations, there's cost issues, fluconazole access issues, and there's been criticism about scaling this up as a public health intervention uh, if we don't have rigorous ev evidence to demonstrate that it's an efficacious and, and beneficial thing to do. And just one study that shows, uh, that suggests some caution before investing large amounts of money in an antigen screening program for cryptococcal disease. This was an NGO uh, HIV program in Kenya uh, where they in introduced screening in uh, 2009. Patients who were antigen positive were treated with high-dose fluconazole and with reducing doses. Uh, they screened 780 patients during the intervention per period and then compared them to historical controls in terms of outcome. Uh, only 66% of the patients during the intervention period were t tested for antigen, uh, antigenemia, so there wasn't very good coverage, only two-thirds coverage. Of those patients, 11% were antigen positive, and of those that were positive, 86% received at least some fluconazole. And when they looked at outcomes in the intervention period compared to the pre-intervention historical controls, there was no effect on mortality. So 25% mortality in those with a CD4 count of less than 100 starting ART, pre-intervention, and 25% during the intervention period. This could be related to the fact that there wasn't adequate coverage, only two-thirds of patients were covered. It could be that fluconazole is not, uh, it, the patients with meningitis were treating with fluconazole and that wasn't efficacious, but it does raise questions about uh, introducing this, uh, scaling it up as a public health intervention until we've got better evidence. And one trial that's looking at this is the AUKUS trial, it's a, it's a CDC funded trial in Uganda, essentially a step wedge randomized design with phased implementation in about 15 ART clinics of antigen screening. Um, and they're screening patients with a CD4 count of less than 100. Once the interven intervention is, is put in place, all patients with a CD4 count of less than 100 are screened with the, with the dipsticks test. If, they dipsticks, if, if the antigen is positive, then they get fluconazole for 800 for two weeks, 
followed by 400 for eight weeks. So it's just 10 weeks of fluconazole, and they obviously start ART two weeks after the, the screen antigen positive. Um, and the primary endpoint is retention and care, which is essentially the, the flip side of death and loss to follow up uh, at six months, uh, comparing the intervention period to the pre-intervention period. And hopefully will provide us better data with respect to the public health um, uh, impact of antigen screening and preemptive treatment for cryptococcal uh, antigenemia. It seems like a good idea detecting antigenemia early, earlier and intervening, treating patients prior to meningitis, given that meningitis has such a high mortality. But there, as I said, there are many operational challenges related to, to, the, to such a program, and these need to be addressed before, before we scale it up. So then to move on to the third issue, it's a, just to cover this briefly, in terms of the initial antifungal treatment of a cryptococcal meningitis, the US guidelines since the 1990s have advised amphotericin B plus flucytosine as the first line therapy. Flucytosine is, is, has very limited availability uh, across many develop, uh, developing world countries. Um, also, that regimen of flu, flu, uh, amphotericin B plus flucytosine was really based, the, the data was based on microbiological outcomes. There was no mortality outcome data to suggest that that was a superior regimen to monotherapy. And then this, uh, this trial was done um, recently by Jeremy Day's group in, in Vietnam that really wanted to show, th to demonstrate that combination therapy for cryptococcal meningitis is superior to monotherapy with amphotericin B using a mortality endpoint. And that would really provide impetus for scaling up of, of combination therapy in develop, developing world countries. So essentially what they compared is patients with HIV associated cryptococcal meningitis with three, randomized to one of three regimens, amphotericin B alone for four weeks, amphotericin B plus flucytosine for two weeks, or amphotericin B plus high dose fluconazole, 400 milligrams BD for two weeks, and then uh, fluconazole consolidation and maintenance following that. And the important message here <coughs> is that the, one of the, the primary, co-primary outcomes was mortality at 70 days. In the amphotericin B monotherapy arm, there were 44 deaths at 70 days. Uh, and then in the combination therapy arms, 30 deaths in amphotericin B plus flucytosine arm and 33 deaths in the amphotericin B plus fluconazole arm. And you can see on the Kaplan-Meier curve, the best survival outcome was with amphotericin B plus flucytosine. So confirming that that is the best uh, initial regimen for treating cryptococcal meningitis. And if one looks at the uh, comparisons that, uh, in terms of the statistical comparisons, Amphotericin B plus flucytosine has its ratio of 0.61, so a 39% reduction that was statistically significant compared to amphotericin B monotherapy. So that that really does establish the, as the gold standard for treating cryptococcal meningitis, amphotericin B plus flucytosine in an adequately powered trial to show that. Amphotericin B plus high dose fluconazole was, uh, there was, the hazards ratio was 0.71, so a 29% reduction but didn't reach significance. Um, but a suggestion there that that is, is superior to, to amphotericin B alone. So the WHI guidelines uh, from 2011, based uh, partly on this data, suggest amphotericin B plus flucytosine. As I said, there are, there's limited access to flucytosine and in, in many developing world uh, countries. And therefore, a second line option was provided, which is amphotericin B plus fluconazole as initial therapy. So that's really based on, on this data. It didn't reach st statistical significance, but there was a trend, as well as uh, data from uh, Thailand, Peter Pappas' uh, study, which showed a trend towards improved outcomes with amphotericin B plus fluconazole compared to amphotericin B alone for induction. So in South Africa, we, now, we don't have access to flucytosine. We use in, induction therapy, amphotericin B, but plus hard as fluconazole, 800 milligrams daily. The data is not as, 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 as robust as for flucytosine, but because we don't have access to flucytosine, we're forced to use fluconazole, and there's a suggestion that that's superior to amphotericin B monotherapy. So finally, to look at the issue of ART timing, and I want to focus particularly on the COAT trial that, uh, that we collaborated on together with uh, David Bulway, based at the University of Minnesota, who was the PI, and colleagues at two sites in Uganda. So I just want to present the case scenario patient 
presents with cryptococcal meningitis, is drowsy, uh, gets an HIV test, low CD4 count, commences amphotericin B therapy, rapidly improves. <coughs> Should you start antiretroviral therapy while the patient's still in the ward? You've got the opportunity, the patient's in the ward, uh, you can counsel them there, they're going to be there for two weeks, you can get them onto ART. Is this the right time to start antiretroviral therapy? And I hopefully provide you an answer to, to that question as I go through this, this last part of the talk. So again, similar to what we discussed this, uh, this morning, the, the, the risks that one has to consider uh, in terms of early versus deferred ART in cryptococcal meningitis is similar to TB, is particularly the mortality risk associated with iris to the, compared to the mortality risk compared to deferring. And the key uh, factors involved is how common is iris, is there mortality associated with the iris? And I'll suggest that that is substantial with cryptococcal meningitis. And then the key factors related to deferring are things like how low is the CD4 count. So in cryptococcal meningitis, unlike TB, there is substantial mortality. In this meta-analysis, one in five patients who developed cryptococcal meningitis iris died. So the iris is associated with, with substantial mortality because of the neurological <coughs> involvement. Prior to the code trial that I'm going to discuss in more detail, there had been three studies that had looked at ART timing in patients with cryptococcal meningitis. The first one on the list was a larger study that looked at patients with a range of opportunistic infections. In that study, the ACTG A5164 study, 41, 41 of those patients had cryptococcal meningitis. And when they looked at the composite endpoint of uh, AIDS progression and mortality, those patients who started earlier had less progression to AIDS or, or, or death than those patients who just deferred. So it seemed from that study that early ART was ben beneficial. In contrast, a Zimbabwe study, small numbers, only 54 patients stopped early by the DSMB. There was higher mortality in patients who started at three days compared to 10 weeks. And in a study done, uh, in, in Botswana, again, a very small study, 27 patients. There was no difference in mortality compared to early deferred ART, but more iris in those patients who started in the first week of, of cryptococcal meningitis treatment. So small studies, uh, different answers, contradicting answers. We didn't have definitive evidence. And the COAT trial, which was the cryptococcal optimal ART timing trial, was conducted in Uganda and South Africa. Essentially, patients with cryptococcal meningitis, ART naive, were randomized to start ART while they were still in hospital, receiving amphotericin B, or to defer to five to six weeks after, after cryptococcal meningitis diagnosis. And the primary endpoint was survival at 26 weeks. The hypothesis was that early ART would reduce mortality similar to what we saw with TB. The target enrollment was 500 but the trial was stopped early by the DSMB because of difference in mortality between the two arms after just one third of the projected patients had been enrolled. Just to mention that the, the cryptococcal treatment was amphotericin B plus fluconazole uh, for the first two weeks. And this is the major finding of the study. Essentially, mortality at six months or survival at six months was 70% in those patients in the deferred arm and 55% in those patients who started early. So a 70% increase in mortality from starting early, in, in uh, direct contrast to the TB studies, starting early caused harm in cryptococcal meningitis. Interestingly, when we looked at, at uh, recognized cryptococcal iris events, there was a, a, a suggestion of increased uh, iris with the early arm, but not statistically significant. So we weren't recognizing more iris but there was substantially more mortality with, associated with starting ART within the first two weeks of cryptococcal meningitis treatment. And just to point out that the, the curves diverged early, that, and that's what really drove this increased mortality, was mortality within the first month of antiretroviral therapy in the early arm. The causes of death, the two most common causes, were cryptococcal-related and bacterial sepsis, and the difference between the two arms was really in cryptococcal-related mortality. Just to say that early ART was particularly harmful in those with, who had depressed level of consciousness at baseline when they presented with cryptococcal meningitis and, and those patients with a white cell count of less than five in the CSF, so suggesting less inflammation at presentation. Those were patients, those uh, two being in those, those predefined strata, 
had it, were associated with a higher hazards ratio for mortality than in the general uh, study population. So what was the cause of excess mortality that was demonstrated in the COAT trial as well as the Zimbabwe trial associated with early, early ART? Was it drug interactions or co-toxicity? There were no cases of liver failure documented in either of the trials. There was one death related to a desquamating rash in the Zimbabwe trial. So it doesn't suggest that, that, it, was, that it, was, it was drug reactions. Was it iris? Uh, important to note that the excess deaths in both the studies were clustered in the first few weeks of antiretroviral therapy. The deaths, certainly in the COAT trial, were ascribed to cryptococcal meningitis rather than being just ascribed to iris. So I'm going to try and make the argument that it was an iris mechanism, an immune pathological mechanism that drove the, the, the mortality in, in at least the COAT trial for which, for which I can speak. Firstly, to make the point that a paucity of inflammation is known to be a risk factor for cryptococcal iris. So those patients in previous studies have had lower CSF white cell counts, have been at increased risk for developing iris. And in the COAT trial, a low uh, CSF white cell count was associated with excess mortality uh, associated with early ART. And to suggest that in the context of patients receiving very early ART it, during the course of cryptococcal meningitis treatment, one might not observe the typical biophasic clinical course that characterizes iris and makes iris easy to diagnose, but rather patients merely present with progressive deterioration. Iris uh, occurring patients with severe neurological dysfunction may be more likely to have fatal consequences. So if you take patients who have severe neurological disease, uh, you then start them on ART before they've had an opportunity to recover. They develop even just a little bit of additional uh, inflammation and immunopathology that can result in rapid death uh, and sudden death manifest, uh, not necessarily manifesting as recognized iris. For instance, through the mechanism of uh, dysfunction of vital brain structures, such as the brain stem, or raised and in sudden increases in, in intracranial pressure. So this is just to, to represent that uh, diagrammatically. Essentially, if you defer ART and you then develop iris, you get this classic biphasic picture. But if you start ART very early, you haven't yet recovered, and some additional neuroinflammation can drive deterioration, rapid deterioration and sudden death that could be explained the, the excess mortality that we saw with early ART in the COAT trial. And what data do we have to support this? This was uh, the lumbar punctures that were done at day 14 on the COAT trial. So this was when patients had been on ART for just five to six days in the early ART arm. Obviously the deferred ART arm were not yet on, on ART. Uh, and we saw that patients in the early ART arm had higher CSF white cell count uh, at day 14 LP and they had increased uh, markers of monocyte activation, soluble CD14 and soluble CD163. We didn't see a cytokine storm in the CSF. There was no elevation of TNF and interferon gamma and interleukins, but we did see some evidence of increased inflammation in the CSF in terms of cells and monocyte markers that were suggestive that early ART was dry, uh, turning on certain uh, inflammatory pathways. So to conclude then on the issue of ART timing, cryptococcal meningitis, cryptococcal meningitis patients generally have low CD4 counts. The median CD4 count in the COAT trial was around 20. But important to note that we now have evidence that there's increased mortality if ART is started within the first two weeks and no harm related to deferring ART to around five to six weeks. Uh, this is different to the TB studies and other opportunistic infections, and it probably relates to iris or immunopathology having a higher mortality when the CNS is involved. Our guidelines in South Africa has now moved to suggesting that ART be started between four to six weeks after the diagnosis of cryptococcal meningitis and not before that. And our hypothesis is that the excess deaths associated with early ART in the COAT trial are related to patients with severe neurological dysfunction, uh, starting ART early, uh, developing additional immunopathology, and that resulting in, in sudden death early after starting ART, not necessarily with the clinical manifestations of iris, but with a similar mechanism, uh, that being immunopathology, giving rise to the, the, the excess deaths. So just to acknowledge the colleagues that I've worked with,
in the cryptococcal meningitis work, particularly David Bullware, that was the uh, PI of the COAT trial and colleagues in Uganda. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for maybe a couple of quick questions. Dan. Graham, I'm interested in your perspective on whether you think the CDC trial in Uganda will uh, adequately address the um, issue of whether uh, prophylactic use of uh, Uganzol, well, you know, in the setting it's possible crack, uh, is going to be enough to drive policy. Uh, you know, the proposal is from the trials group to do a trial, and we're not certain that the trial will have an additional added impact. And, uh, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that, that the way to go is, is a, a, a cluster randomized intervention rather than individual patient uh, clinical trial. And I think that because it, it addresses the operational issues around it, and I think that it will provide, if, uh, it, it will provide a, a definitive answer for a, a very resource poor country like Uganda. If it doesn't work in Uganda, it doesn't mean that it wouldn't necessarily work in South Africa. But I think for similarly resourced countries and, and uh, service challenged countries like Uganda, it will provide an answer because it, 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 it includes those, those service level factors that an individual uh, patient trial can't, can't include. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, and, and as long as it's, it, 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 it can run to the full, it's, it's intended to uh, enroll 3,000 patients combining intervention and, and pre-intervention period. And, and hopefully it will provide the definitive answer. The other issue about individual patient uh, trial is, is it's very difficult ethically to, to, to design a study. You can't randomize patients to getting nothing if you detect antigenemia. If you compare two uh, interventions, you might find nothing because the interventions are too similar. Thanks very much. So, uh, Dr. Ryan, you Suddenly I published, uh, Elsa Brunner and, and uh, Merle Sandy did a study in Uganda of patients with cryptococcal meningitis and found that most of them actually had a febrile illness and headache for an average of 10 days before finding their way to like a hospital and diagnosis and treatment and, and often were misdiagnosed as malaria. And uh, I don't know what the intervention would you know how you would deal with this, but it always seemed to me is that it's the the the, let, the time before a patient comes and has a diagnosis that you know you need to compress yeah. to really impact on mortality. Yeah. I, I mean, I, just a, two quick answers to that. I think the one is making you know primary healthcare providers more aware of the the, the diagnosis, and then getting that the dipsticks out to primary care settings, because the the big issue is. If, even if they're aware of it, sending patients to a central hospital to get a lumbar puncture with all the, the stigma and concerns about lumbar punctures in many countries it is a barrier to a accessing a diagnosis. And I, I think those are the two interventions that could make a very big difference. Oh, we have one more. Uh, uh, next one, if you have experience in managing ILS in cryptococcal meningitis patients, because this is uh, the major cause of. Uh, case fatality in cryptococcal meningitis patients and in other conditions if there is severe iris we tend to be steroids so the steroids are contraindicated in fungal infections so it looks there is some paradoxical conditions in yeah. if you have so, so I would say that steroids are contraindicated. Uh, th there is a concern about using steroids in cryptococcal meningitis because it's been shown that those patients with less inflammation have the wor uh, have poorer outcomes in terms of interferon gamma responses. So there are some concerns about steroids, but certainly in patients who develop significant uh, cryptococcal iris, we do uh, we initially treat them with analgesia and therapeutic taps. But if it's severe, if they've got depressed level of consciousness or it's refractory, we would use steroids uh, to treat it. And pa I've seen patients have very dramatic anecdotal responses to steroids treated for treating cryptococcal iris. Um, we don't use it in all patients and there's no clinical trials data, but anecdotally we do see patients having good response. And Jeremy Day, who performed the Vietnamese trial that I discussed with you, is now performing a multi-country uh, multi study looking at steroids in all cases of cryptococcal meningitis at diagnosis, uh, steroids versus placebo to see whether th that will improve outcomes. So 
you know, it's still an open question about the use of steroids in cryptococcal meningitis. And there might, there might potentially be benefit if one's in the ART era, if we hypothesize that uh, starting ART is a contributor to some of the mortality through immunopathology. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to have to move on, but thank you.